Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have fun this afternoon. So, no data, no data, just some great cases and amazing speakers. And some of them you met and some others you haven't met, so we'll, we'll go through that. The format is we're going to have a live case from the lab, from our lab. Mike Quinones just uh, went up there. It is actually a patient of mine. And then we're going to have some taped cases and then go back to the lab and have another live case and taped cases. So it's going to be very interactive. We want you to be engaged, ask questions, whatever it is, but, but it will be a lot of fun. The other thing I want to invite you is if you want to subscribe to the YouTube channel under DeBakey Institute or DeBakey Education, uh, you will have weekly free imaging conferences throughout the year as well as our grand rounds every week. It's posted and actually uh, you could be online live if you want to or you could have it offline and uh, you'll be joining about 4,000 plus individuals throughout the world that, that watch these. So they're there free for you. Um, I think they're ready, right, uh, Tyree? They're ready upstairs. What I'm going to do is, is uh, this is a, a patient of mine, actually, and the patient of mine is up in the lab, and she was very nice to volunteer, but I'm going to share with you her case uh, because what we're doing is actually a follow-up. We have some diagnostics, but it's a follow-up on a previous study that she had before. Uh, I saw her about a year ago. She came in with dyspnea, and when she's referred by a previous trainee of mine, a cardiologist who's a very good cardiologist in town, you know you're in for some further investigation. If he couldn't figure it out, I don't know if we're going to be able to figure it out. And I want to thank her if she's listening, thank her for coming this afternoon. She is 78, had a history of diastolic heart failure, but I think you'll see later why this history was quite impressive. Mitral regurgitation. These are the diagnoses that she came in with, with pulmonary hypertension, uh, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, presented in October for a second opinion for dyspnea on exertion and diastolic heart failure. And let me tell you, she used to run up to six mile marathons at her age. And uh, Randy, she's beating you. <laughs> <laughs> and she had no symptoms. And if you tell me how many times she told me that she was so frustrated that within one year she could no longer do what she's able to do. That is the big frustrating thing. And she said, the doctor referred me to you because you know he thinks very highly of you, et cetera. Can you help me out? Because it is so frustrating for me. I have so much energy up here and everywhere, but I cannot do it. So developed New York three and four symptom, heart associated over the past one year and up to eight hospitalizations for heart failure. Exas requiring home oxygen. Blood pressure remained uncontrolled at home, 180, 190, despite multiple medications and salt compliance. So you don't have to read the whole thing. I just want you to read the medications on the right side. Metformin, di diabetes is not an issue. Uh, two diuretics, amlodipine, valsartan, metoprolol, 200 milligrams, and still her pressure, 160, 170. Okay, and she's 78. And she had other medical illnesses, but they were not the issue. Now, she was told she had part of the, besides the treatment, she was treated for pulmonary hypertension because they felt she had primary pulmonary hypertension maybe. So she went through that and she felt horrible with the treatment, took it off and you know, still had the hospitalizations in between. And this is her physical exam, hypertensive, predominantly systolic hypertension, uh, not much overweight and uh, by basal arouse, a systolic murmur no edema at the time when we saw her. And this is the diagnostics, at least what, we, what I was able to see when I saw her. Her EKG is better than yours and mine. <laughs> um, and uh, electrolytes, potassium borderline, creatinine, not too bad for her age, 1.2. Uh, white count is, I'll tell you, it's a red herring, but you know, I had to think about it coming in. Platelets were a little bit on the high side. Hemoglobin A1C, TSH was normal, okay? And I'll give you quite a bit of the diagnostics. This is what I had when I saw her. She had a heart cath at that time, normal coronaries, PA systolic pressure 62, PCW 33, 
cardiac output of six, LV EDP of 26. Echo, hyperdynamic LV function done outside, mildly depressed RV function, PA systolic 50, high left ventricular filling pressure, mild mitral regurgitation. The cardiologist said, I don't understand it. I mean, she has little pulmonary hypertension, cannot be a really primary pulmonary hypertension maybe. May, uh, certainly her cardiac output is not depressed, right? Hypertensive on all these meds and everything else. So they got a cardiac MRI, and the cardiac MRI said moderate LV enlargement, severe RV enlargement, mild uh, depressed LV function, 53%, severe RV depression, moderate functional mitral regurgitation, and then voila, you know? Do what, what do I do now? So you do now, you come to Dr. Z, uh, who's gonna figure out, sure. I mean, like I said, uh, listen, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do some diagnostic. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to get you back to the marathon running of. Did you look at her echo? Did you, did you see the I, I looked at the echo, ventricular function was good, but I said, hmm, since the MRI was done after the echocardiogram, maybe things have happened. So we repeat it. So this is, the, this is the other echo that we've done, okay? So uh, as you could tell, ventricular function is not depressed, really. The RV is on the bigger side. Uh, RV is a bit depressed, although if you look on the uh, four-chamber view, it may be misleading. Your TAPSI, your famous TAPSI, which uh, I'm not in love with, is, uh, is uh, pretty much all normal. I think when TAPSI goes down, the heart is no more existent. So, so Bill, you, you're saying you don't, I mean, the parasternal short axis view at the mitral valve level. Yes. RV looks big. Yes, exactly. You were, you were saying you didn't think it was big? It is big. Echo assessment of RV, as we can tell, is very difficult, and I rely much more on short axis because this is where you don't foreshorten the right ventricle. Four chamber view can take you in so many different positions for the right ventricle. Uh, if it is large, yes. If it is normal, it can be misleading. And the mitral regurgitation is really not moderate, right? It's not so moderate. it's not moderate. It's, it's mild MR. It's, it's nothing impressive. Still systolic hypertension, and this is her. Doppler uh, data. And uh, Steve, can I invite you to the front so you could, guys can share also the, uh, and we're gonna get you up when, when I get up on the, on the podium so we can all be involved. So for, as you recall from, her, from diastolic function assessment, take a look at this mitral inflow for her, right? E velocity is quite high, almost 1.3. A short deceleration time, you have an L wave there, uh, you know, there. Uh, so it is, you know, not normal for somebody who has a very large left atrium and uh, some hypertrophy. Uh, take a look at the tissue Doppler, E prime and, and at the septum and the lateral wall. E prime, you know, may be almost normal for her, but septal is quite low. So the ratio of E over E prime is high, is more than 14. So her filling pressures are elevated actually with normal systolic function. And her TR jet velocity, not complete, right? But as you could tell, is at least a 3.3, 3.0. So PA pressure, again, still elevated in the 50s, somewhere there, okay? Quite large, it's like, uh, it's like 40, 45 milliliter it's, per meter yeah. squared. Okay? So that's what we have so far, and uh, Hey, Bill, is, looking at the, excuse me, at the TR jet, yes. her uh, DPDT is not severely reduced, if you look at that, right. which would make you think that she probably has some I mean, RV the RV function. function is not severely depressed. I mean, I, I, I mean, it is depressed, but, you know, not a fallen out uh, right ventricle, right? So this was our, um, you know, to kind of put it in a capsule, normal LV size, mild LV enlargement, depressed uh, RV function, normal LVEF, high filling pressure, PA systolic pressure by 55. What would I do, right? I mean, she's on diuretics. She's on everything else. Uh, what would you do? So your cardiologist in the, in the city who you trained, right? And this patient is coming in. And what are you going to do differently? Besides, you know, tweaking her diuretics, maybe more, maybe add an ACE inhibitor. She's on, not on an ACE inhibitor, right? What are you What's wrong do? with her? Huh? You talk about do something to her. What's wrong with her? What's, What's wrong with her? What's wrong with her, Randy? <laughs> Absolutely. 
Right. Uh, she's concerned. Uh, well, we haven't introduced her yet, but uh, okay, she uh, could be. She could Dr. Be Dr. Be Vera Riglin, who, who is uh, uh, just the current president of the American Society of Echo and uh, professor of, of medicine and cardiology. You get to see her. Uh, and uh, she said that she's concerned about her pressure. I'm concerned about her I'm, pressure. I'm not only concerned about her blood pressure at rest, I'm also concerned about what it does with exercise. Got it. Concerned about sleep apnea. Um, they didn't come into the, I mean, <laughs> she, she could be waking up all, I mean, like she had so much energy, she wouldn't believe it. <laughs> So uh, I was concerned, uh, just to make the story short, I was concerned about hypertension, still decent output, high filling pressure, let's say, well, uh, let's think about something else for secondary hypertension that's going on in this person, okay? And let me share a few things with you. Uh, this is the, the, these are the first things. So I did an echocardiogram, that's the only thing I did, and this workup. Uh, normal metanephrines, catechols, aldosterone to renin ratio 107, CT of the abdomen with adrenal pathology uh, high res, didn't show anything. Saline suppression test uh, modified with capital failed to suppress. So the aldosterone was high. What would you do? Uh, besides silence. Is it? <laughs> I'm sorry? Renal vascular ultrasound. I didn't do it, but I can tell you it was negative. Huh? She was not on aldactone. She was not on aldactone. You would try to. Why? Okay. This, uh, this is an interesting situation because I know she's 78 and everything else, but if you're really thinking, uh, I'll tell you one thing. CT scan for a detection of a secreting tumor of the adrenal the yield is low, very low. So if you're serious about taking this to a different level, you know what you need to do. What do you need to do? No, not MRI. Rena venous sampling of the renal veins. Venous sampling of the renal veins to look at this and take a look, okay? Adrenal vein sampling showed a very high aldosterone, 1870, and cortisol. So this tumor could be secreting both aldosterone as well as cortisol, while on the left side, it was 577 and 75. So what we told her actually is that you have a lateralizing thing. It could be a tumor. May not be completely curative because the other adrenal is still functioning, and you may have adrenal hyperplasia, but one of them is secreting much more than the other. Obviously, that was not only my recommendation, but the endocrine who specializes in, in this situation. So she had the wet laparoscopic resection of the adrenal gland. BP much improved with de-escalation of medication down to carvedilol twice a day and amlodipine without anything else. Improved exercise tolerance. New York Heart Association actually between one and two, believe it or not, after a year and a half now, she's, she's a little older. And she was so nice to come today because I haven't taken a look at the echocardiogram at all since that time. And uh, she's asymptomatic. You'd say, why do you want to do it? I think it's just of interest, and she's volunteering. So she's with, he, with us today to take a look at this heart, take a look at ventricular function. And Mike Quinones and uh, our uh, sonographer, Clara Angulo, up there is uh, in the lab. So can we switch to the lab and see if we can see them live? Hey, Miguel. Hey, how are you guys? Fine, how are you? <laughs> All right, we're arm and ready. Long time no see. Clara, how Long are you? Long time no see. Clara, Clara cannot hear you. Clara, how are you? She's fine. She says she's fine. <laughs> and how is Mrs. And your P? patient is How is fine Mrs. P? <laughs> how is she doing? <laughs> she's doing great. She, she, she was falling asleep while we were taking some pictures. <laughs> okay. Well, what are you going to show us? You, you heard the story, Miguel. Absolutely. I, I would emphasize, I guess, the uh, function of both ventricles, particularly right ventricle, is it better? Filling dynamics and PA pressure. Okay, can you see the uh, images? We can see it so beautifully. Okay, so you can see a very nicely contracting LV. Size-wise, for her body size, maybe a little upper limit, it's around five. 
Um, LV mass might be increased, but the relative wall thickness does not appear to be significantly high. And even in this view, we still can appreciate that the left atrium is enlarged. She had a little bit of focal thickening of the valves. Importantly, notice that even though the EF is very good, the anterior mitral leaflet opens with a little bit of restriction. This is what I call academic mitral stenosis. It's not a big deal, except that it could possibly increase the E velocity a little more than usual just because of this. Something to keep in mind. So now we're going to go to the short axis. Actually, no, we're going to do the RV inflow view first. Yeah, let's do an RV inflow view. And I think by eyeball, the RV still looks a little bit enlarged. We will see it better in other views. And what we're looking here is overall wall motion seems to be okay, and we're going to look for TR. And just like it happened the last time, Bill, her TR is not a lot. Yes. But we think we can probably get a little bit. Scale. Whatever you think you're good. Preset. So right now it's looking like around three. Around three. Yeah. It's uh, we will try that in the four chamber view also. So let's go to a short axis. And again, we confirm the good LB function from an EF point of view. RV, um, RV here's a moderator smaller. band that RV, sometimes can make the septum look a little thicker. Miguel. Our view yes. looks smaller on the short axis compared to what you Yes, see. sir. Yes. It um, does. And actually, it's, it still con out. it's contracting nicely. And so we're going to go towards the RV outflow view and uh, try to see the TR again from this view. Yeah, the, the RV is not only it's a little TR, you smaller, want to go but there was a views. little septal flattening, a little bit on yes. the first echo that's no longer present. That's true. That's correct. Once again, we're hitting right about three, yeah. plus or minus. I mean, in, in that 30 to 35 range or so. We're going to also show you a right ventricular outflow, pulse wave, because that's another way that we can get a hint of PA pressure at least. Uh, and it's, she still has a little bit of a, of a notch. She does. A little bit. You go ahead and freeze it someplace so where you can. I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah. It, it is a short acceleration. I see that time of acceleration tells you something about her, you know, pulmonary uh, vascular resistance. So that's okay, but I'll tell you. However, uh, notice that she has an it. excellent integral. So this goes along also with very good uh, stroke volume in the right side. Yes. All right. So if you're okay, we'll go to the apical views. Let's do that. So far, she's been reasonably echogenic. <laughs> Our steam sonographer is moving around, adjusting to get the uh, apical views. And again, you can rapidly see that that mitral valve has a little bit of restrictive mobility. Yes. Not a lot. Uh, we might do a CW later to see how that is, but let's first uh, get oriented with the four chamber view. Yeah, I would concentrate, Miguel, for the discussion yes. on predominantly diastolic function and see what happened over time since it uh, looks like RV that function is, correct. is best. So um, we're going to start with the LB first. We'll try to get the RV later, but in this view, we can again appreciate that the left edge enlargement is still there. Uh, EF is still reasonable. And let's open up this mitral valve area a little better. And let's put the sample volume in the annulus first. So we're going to start at the annulus. And that's where we will try to see the, dura the duration of the A wave, overall patterns. That even in this view, the E is a little higher than the A. Yeah. But we haven't crossed the valve yet. So now we're going to go ahead and cross the valve. 
just move over to the tips of the used to be about 1.4, 1.3 or so. And you can like freeze this. it. So Don't if I remember the slides that Dr. Selby showed, she still have an E higher than A, but the acceleration time has improved significantly. Yes. So I, my gut feeling is that probably there's some improvement in the feeding pressures. We, we will do a tissue doper in a minute. Um, but this, the most impressive finding to me is that the deceleration time now seems to be much prolonged compared to the other one. Yes. Mike, uh, two questions. Yeah. One, do you think that's an L wave? And two, the duration of the A wave? Yes, yeah, so, so the duration of the A wave is better to measure in the annulus. We can go back, let's see if we can get pulmonary veins. And if we can, we'll go back and, and try to compare them. Steve, to be honest, I'm not sure. What do you guys think? Do you think that's an L? Uh, it's possible. It's, it's, it's soft, and yeah. I can't see the scale on the left. It's no, not. It's, it's only about 30. Yeah, OK. Yeah. And she's not, she has a nice low heart rate. But I, I tell you, from a number one, from a clinical point of view, she's a different person. And for me not to have seen her for about that's nine months in between, without any further hospitalizations. I remember how many hospitalizations she had, Perfect. right? And she feels like, <clears throat> like a rose. And We're uh, going to try the pulmonary veins. So the major change is here, most likely the pulmonary hypertension component because her PA pressure went down significantly, RV, you know, but uh, conceivably with a bigger output, your E velocity stays high. And remember that E velocity is high, not necessarily only because of diastolic function, but there is some restriction to mitral inflow, right? Beautiful. It's a very Stop. mild, you know, mitral stenosis, if you will, but some restriction to Okay, so inflow. you guys <clears throat> can see a pulmonary vein. Yeah. Um, she still has a little bit of more prominence of diastolic than systolic, but we all have seen it worse. And I'll try to measure this duration here. Can you measure the time here? So uh, Clara is going to try to measure the duration of that A wave and then go back to the annulus. Looks a little longer here. There, there. You know, the difference is between 30 milliseconds and maybe more 50 milliseconds that LVEDP go. would be high, huh? All right, so we are getting, how much? We just want a time. What is the scale? We're trying to figure I'm out. I'm guessing about. Uh, it's hard to tell, actually. You know, you, you see some yeah. reversal, but there is an overlap of flow. Uh, there we go. Okay, so 155 milliseconds. Yeah. Dr. Martin, you think you can remember that number for the next two minutes? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go to the analysts. <laughs> I'm not sure that I can remember it. <laughs> All right, so here comes the analyst, and we're going to stop it and do a quick measurement here. Same measurement. <laughs> it is shorter. Yeah. Uh, here, about seven years. Take so. it right about there. Yeah. And that's 124. 124. So she still has prolongation of the not pulmonary much, vein A wave. Not much. It's about 30 milliseconds, Miguel. 30 not milliseconds. Much. Yeah, yeah. Not much. It should be more than 50 to be pathognomonic. Very good. Can we get that just tissue Doppler for uh, just for the That's completion? what we're doing next. All right. So let's go tissue Doppler. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Bill, if I remember the slides that you showed, the E prime in the septum was really low. Yes, sept septum was and now we're getting five to still six. It's around five. Yeah, it was five to six. Yeah, it's still in the same range. And, and now we're going to go to lateral. To ten, nine to ten, the other one, the lateral wall. And lateral, we are also on the low side. We are, we're going to stop and, and measure it. Go ahead and make a measurement. It looks by eyeball around seven, but let's see what we get. Uh, 7.4, yeah. So the average would be six, and certainly the E prime was high, but I, I have a little concern about the mitral valve area. So yes. we're going to do a CW 
across the mitral valve, yeah, just for right interest here. See, whenever you have some mitral valve dysfunction, E over E prime doesn't really tell you about filling pressures, right? So, yeah, and put it someplace where we can measure it. Yeah, stop anytime, anywhere. 1.5 plus. And measure it. So we have a peak velocity by CW of about 1.5, which again, this is academic mitral stenosis, but I personally would not use the E over E prime as a numerical ratio to calculate LAP. I would use the pattern, which clearly is abnormal. So I th the one more other thing we can do is an IVRT. Let's, let's try to get an IVRT, because that also might be of some help. For the IVRT, you just put a CW in between the LV outflow and mitral inflow, so you can get them both. Beautiful, and you can stop there and measure. And by eyeball, it looks shortened, but we yes. can do a quick measurement now. <clears throat> so, so far, it looks like she still has a little bit of uh, borderline, perhaps, uh, LAP in, in large increase. Mike, don't try to get a little better. I think you've got something else on the end of it. I don't know if that's a pure ejection curve. You may be falsely making your IVRT short. I could be wrong. Uh, you have to get the ejection curve, otherwise you're going to measure the IVRT. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's pure enough. It may not well, be that short. That, and it's what, better if you have we a have comparison. We didn't it. have a, you know, it's, it's better to compare IVRT, study A to study B, than just getting one de novo. Yeah, but w particularly in calc when you have some calcifications, IVRT is important yeah. to try to help you figure it out. And, and the cutoff is about 80 milliseconds. Less than that. Yeah, we're getting about 60. Yeah. I mean, she may still have, you know, some dysfunction, uh, certainly some diastolic dysfunction she does, but the most important. So thing, now we're going to look at the RV and TR. Much Let's better. Let's try to concentrate more on the RV as, side. As Bill is trying to say, treat the patient and not the numbers. You got it. So but I, th I think it was so out of, that's why it is out of interest to just take a look and see. Okay, Dr. Goldstein. With this what, what do you think of that RV? RV? A lot better than before. Particularly short access to me. I mean, this, these were the two views that you could really Go ahead and compare. Do a of the yeah. Okay. Particularly the two that you could compare. And, and she yep. still has some Ran behind. While we're speaking, Randy raised, I'm going to raise, an, Randy raised a nice point. And I do use the TR jet like we use the MR. I, I just kind of eyeball it. I usually don't measure it for a DPDT, but it is another measure of RV function we can get from the TR jet. Another one that people don't pay attention to that there is some money in, and it's something called Revazzi, RV outflow track systolic excursion. It's like TAPSI, but no, Gad Karen from Israel looked at the same parameter. You, you can look at excursion of the RV wall in, a, in a either short axis or parasternal long, like we do TAPSI, there are, va there are values for that. So it's just all these little accessory things, other ways to look at. You can, you can actually look at, in your tissue Doppler, you can look at the, uh, not the S prime, but the, the isovolumic. People have looked at, at the amplitude and slope of that as well. Little things that I'm not sure where money, I can add money a couple or not. Of things, Steve. Yes. Um, here, you, here we can see her tricuspid annulus uh, tissue Doppler, and a couple of things are very nice. Her E prime is 10. In fact, it's like 11. Right. Her peak systolic velocity is 10. And yeah, one thing right. I, I teach a fellow is that if you cannot get a good TAPSI with N mode, if you do the integral of this velocity, it is also TAPSI because the integral of a velocity is the displacement sure, of that particular is. region. So some, and, and we have done it, we have validated it. You get exactly the same number if you do this integral versus if you measure by end mode. So it's a nice backup because sometimes the end mode for some, for some reason is not that good. Yes. But this to me is very encouraging. She has very nice, num very nice numbers here. Well, Mike, I, I want to thank you and Clara, and certainly thank Mrs. P for her coming and, uh, and volunteering this afternoon on a Friday afternoon, her time. Uh, that's, you could relate to her that uh, certainly the right ventricle is better, her pressure are better, 
and uh, we now we can document that she really feels so much better. <laughs> and uh, we also we also did look at the TR velocity before we started, and it was also three. So she clearly is around three, which is in low forties. Which is which is comparable with her age. Yes, ex exactly. Yeah. Uh, Miguel, uh, thank you. you. You can text us when you're ready for case number two. Meanwhile, we're going to do some taped cases. Will do. Thank you very much. Miguel. One other, one other point, and this, this nice woman didn't have it, but when you see an older age person, especially a woman with mitral annular disease and valvular disease that's extensive, you should think about mitral infotrach stenosis or partial stenosis. Um, it's not at all uncommon to see these people come in with a mean gradient of three to five, and you just walk, exercise them on the, on the echo bed, and their mean gradient will go to 10 or something like that. So it's, a, it's just another thing to think about in dyspneal exertion in some of the elderly people, especially women who have mitral annular disease. It's moderate to significant. I think we're all, Randy. Uh, I want to go up. Let's go. I'd, I'd like to invite the, our speakers to come, uh, Randy, also. And we'll introduce you when you're here. Come. Well, we're going to do some taped cases, but first let me introduce our esteemed panelists and, and speakers. To my left is, I know I mentioned her, Dr. Vera Riglin. She's the president of the American Society of Echocardiography and professor of medicine and cardiology at Northwestern in Chicago. And on my right is Dr. Gustavo Restrepo. He is the president of the Society of Inter-American Cardiology, and he's from Colombia. And thank you really for coming. And uh, to my left further, Dr. Jose Banks uh, from neighboring MD Anderson, head of the laboratory there, and also heads our uh, American Society of Echocardiography Foundation. And uh, Dr. Cavalcanti has been introduced already. So great, and we look forward to your presentations. Who wants to go first? Vera, you want to try sure. that? Yeah. All right. There, Why don't you go up there, and this way you can. So if you could put Dr. Vera Riglin's uh, presentation, it would be great. So um, while my cases are coming up, I first want to thank Dr. Zogby and the course directors for inviting me here. And uh, it's really a pleasure considering that I'm from Chicago and it's 30 degrees there. <laughs> and when I got off the plane, it was 80. I thought I was in South America. <laughs> You're closer. <laughs> yes. So thank you for inviting me here and getting me out of Chicago winter. So I am going to present. I have two cases here. I'll do one and then see if we have time for the second one, or I can let the others go, and then I can do the second case later. Uh. All right, so my, um, my cases here are of cardiac masses. And pay attention, because there's audience response. So first case is a 54-year-old female with a history of hypertension. Um, and she has a sister with leukemia. And the sister needs a bone marrow, a stem cell transplant. And this, the patient was found to be a really good match for her sister and came to the oncologist for a preoperative evaluation prior to stem cell donation. And she was feeling perfectly fine, perfectly healthy, no issues aside from her hypertension. Here's her physical exam. She's hypertensive. No, this is not another case of an adrenal tumor. <laughs> Blood pressure is 170 over 100, heart rate's 88. Um, she was not in any heart failure, and the rest of her physical exam was completely normal. Here's her EKG. Um, she's in sinus rhythm, and she has some nonspecific STT wave abnormalities. The oncologist, who was um, kind of slept through her EKG rotation in medical school, didn't feel comfortable um, sending this patient for stem cell transplant based on the abnormal EKG and suggested a cardiology consult. So she came to the, um, the cardiology office for consultation, again, claimed to be feeling perfectly fine, but because of the EKG, uh, what would you, the, with this abnormal test now, asymptomatic patient with hypertension, abnormal EKG, needs to be a stem cell donor. What would you do next? Would you order a transthoracic echo? 
an MRI, a CT, or nothing. You just send her to surgery. <laughs> I'd love seeing the interactive things. Like, oh, they all said this, so then I got to change Can mine, I change right? That? <laughs> okay, so about 85 percent or so um, say to get a transthoracic echo. Um, a smaller percentage say do nothing. Okay. I guess this wouldn't be much of an imaging conference if we really did do nothing, but I, I don't think that that would necessarily be an abnormal choice given that she's asymptomatic. But nevertheless, an echo was obtained and here's her echo. So here's the parasternal long axis view. Okay. She maybe has some thick walls, kind of a smallish cavity, um, kind of goes along with her hypertension. RV may be a little generous in size. Here, here. And we go to the short axis here. Okay. Maybe a hint of some septal flattening, maybe not, maybe a little off axis. Okay, now we get to the right, the apical views. And I purposely left this as a still, and I want you to tell me what's wrong here. Hmm. Hey, the, the RV looks big. Where was it hiding? Okay, can you please make so the movie move? The other, hold it, Vera, before you make it move, I'm just looking at the, um, at the atrial wall over there near the uh, takeoff of the left atrial appendage and things. Because the RV is obviously the big thing, but, mm -hmm. but on the still, the atrial wall looks a little funny on the still. Okay, all right, so let's put it in motion and see. Oh, go back. Go back. So she doesn't have to worry about the atrial <laughs> wall. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know why, I'll Just tell you why the, I was the raising that there. question, okay? I'm not, look, I'm not, I think there's an important point. That's just okay. an artifact, okay? So, uh, so yes, the, the atrial was a little thick, but yes, there is something bigger going on here. That's so does right. it still look, does left. this look normal or abnormal? Okay, so now let's let, look it up a little bit more closely. So we have this um, little softball uh, bouncing back and forth um, in the right side of the heart. Okay, and in case you didn't see it well enough, here it is in close proximity again. Okay, and then we turn on the color Doppler, and there really isn't much tricuspid regurgitation, I think because the mass is plopping right onto the tricuspid valve and preventing tricuspid regurgitation from, uh, from occurring. Here's her uh, TR velocity, and her PA or RV systolic <coughs> pressure is, is normal. Here's another view. This is more of an RV focus view, and it gives you a little better appreciation of the, of the size of this mass. So, Vera, you didn't think that was prolapsing into the right atrium? I think it is prolapsing into the right atrium. But I think it's so large that it's actually, when it goes into the right atrium, it probably is, is, is yeah, on tamponading the, the, the trichosis. On the Doppler, valve. you could almost see a tumor plop on that. Um, yeah. If you look there, okay, so, but it is prolapsing into the right atrium. It is prolapsing into the right atrium, and you'll see a little bit more in a minute. So just to, um, because we, we love 3D, here's a 3D image of it. I'm not sure it adds a whole lot to it, but certainly makes for some interesting pictures. And I think here you can appreciate that it's going into the right atrium once it starts to move right. again. All right. So now what? So let me ask you, Vera, did you do any subcostal imaging to see where it's attached or where it's coming from, like IVC, interatrial septum, yada, yada, very, yada? Very good question. And Thank subsequent you. imaging, you'll be able to see that. Yes. Sorry, subsequent In subsequent imaging. imaging, you'll be able to see that. Subsequent. Subsequent imaging. <laughs> This is a multimodality conference, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm following yeah, instructions. It is, yeah. <laughs> just, just it is a multimodality. I know that, but I <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's a very important question. And she was kind of a big lady, so her subcostal images were not very good. But point well taken that it is important to see the point of attachment so, because it may make a difference as yeah, to what it is. Yeah, and the differential of right atrial mass is even big as you have to think about something coming up from below, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Exactly. Okay, so we're kind of right smack in the middle here between a TEE and an MRI. Mm. 
I don't think necessarily that either one is wrong, but in this case, an MRI was chosen. What do you know? So in answer to your question of whether or not it's in the right atrium, yes, it does plop into the right atrium, as you see here. And then another frame, you see it in the right ventricle. So it's really moving quite uh, vigorously across that tricuspid valve. Okay, and then here's just another view, and it gives you an appreciation of the size of the mass. That's big. And then now um, we um, show some uh, gadolinium images demonstrating that there is a contrast uptake into the mass, which means what? Could be a metastatic mass, would be one thing. Okay. Got vascular supply, right? Vascular could be supply, a, Could exactly. be a myxoma. Could be a, could myxoma. Be a myxoma. It doesn't say what it is, it just says that uh, there's blood a, flow it's in not there. A lot. So, suppose. so that's my next question. What is this? Given what you've seen so far, what is this? Is it a myxoma? Is it a sarcoma? Is it a thrombus? Or is it a vegetation? Have the thrombus is going down. <laughs> make, make it zero. Yes. Remember <laughs> that we just... We just <laughs> <laughs> I will. I'd get the so, vegetation so out of there, too. <laughs> Explain you again. You 5% vote something else. <laughs> Obviously, there was a little bit, of, little bit of confusion of the vascular nature of the, the, the contrast uptake in the mass suggests that there's a vascular blood supply. <laughs> And thrombus and vegetation actually do not have a vascular blood supply. So that um, last picture that I showed you pretty much eliminates thrombus and vegetation and leans us more towards tumor. Okay, doesn't say what kind of tumor, but it just suggests that it's a tumor with some kind of vascular blood supply. Thrombus ah! is back. <laughs> 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 that's, that's their story, no, and they're sticking it to it. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's keep going here. So the patient was actually taken to the operating room, and hold, um, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. This is big, Vera. So that that you did other you did other views to see what you that so it wasn't coming up from the IVC. It was it wasn't, not coming it's up. It's obviously from the not IVC. invading because you don't have a pericardial effusion. Correct. So it wasn't coming from the IVC or the SVC. Correct. Okay. It seemed to be originating in the heart. Got it. Got it. And right. and again on this T you'll see exactly where it where it's originating from or where it's attached to. So because of the of the size of the mass and the concern for a tumor, she was taken to the operating room to have the tumor resected. And I do have to tell you that our working diagnosis, like the majority in this room, was that it was a myxoma. Okay, so that was our working diagnosis, and that's what we all thought it was. Yeah, but you can't, any, to any tumor, primary tumor in the right, right heart, you still have to keep sarcoma on the Absolutely. Absolutely. All, all, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Or so the, the right atrium. Or the RV outflow tract, too. Right, so point well taken. So especially if it's in the right atrium, angiosarcomas are commonly arise in that area. So and the bottom line is echo is not histology. So we can't, you know, assert somebody is going to answer this and I would add that even cardiac MR is also not, you know, um, the, the it can provide you some other additional information, but we cannot get to the histology level as much as we love it. So that's right. So thus why she went to the operating room. And here's a few more views. Okay, so here's the um, the, the color, and again, I think that the amount of TR is not as great as it otherwise would be because the mass is so large, it's preventing the blood from going back right into now. the right atrium. And this, here's another view here. This is more of a um, kind of a short axis view. You can see it plop across the tricuspid valve. And here's the view, well, here's. <laughs> there's, there's another one there's there. There's another one. Ah, looks like there's another one there. That change, that does change the... I actually struck us Yeah. And here's where I think the origin, uh, or where you see the tumor attached. And it looks like it's attached to the right atrial wall just above the annulus of the tricuspid right. valve. Yeah. Yeah. So that is a rather atypical location for a myxoma. A, a more typical location would be in the intratrial septum, yeah. which is not where this is attached to. 
could have done the perfusion. Those sarcomas tend to be ugly looking. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is too smooth, isn't it? Circular. Right. The second tumor raises the possibility of familial mixomas. Right. Yes, there was no family history of, of any tumor, but you're correct, and that it, she could be the first one. All right, so here's, uh, again, looking at it from the ventricular side. And it can end up okay. being none of the two that we're counting right now. Exactly. So this is what was found. Uh, this is the description of the tumor when they took it out in the operating room. It was a hard tumor with smooth borders found protruding from the right ventricle through the septal and posterior leaflet commissure. It had a bilobed shape, and it measured three by two centimeters. The large lobe measured three by two centimeters, and the small lobe measured one by one centimeters. All three of the tricuspid valve leaflets were torn. And again, I think the amount of TR was probably underestimated because the mass was tamponading the, the amount of flow. And so she underwent excision of the tumor and repair of the tricuspid valve. So that's what the tumor looked like when it was Basement. removed. Okay. That's another view of it there. Hey. And that's what it looked. There's the, uh, the histology and there's the gross uh, <laughs> specimen after they took it out. So it was actually a lyomyoma, which is a uterine fibroid. So you're like, what the heck? What is a uterine fibroid doing inside the heart? <laughs> and that's what we said, too. Like, it's in the wrong place. But, and it's true, these uh, lyomyomas are benign, smooth muscle tumors that are normally found in the uterus, but, and they're found um, in, mostly in females, but believe it or not, that you can get um, cardiac invasion. It's rare, but it happens. There's about 200 case reports. And they get to the heart through intravenous lyomyotosis, which is when a little piece of the, uh, of the fibroid goes through the, uh, the uterine vein up and travels all the way up to the heart and just takes seats itself right in the heart and then begins to grow like it grows in the uterus. There is um, also, there are some case reports of spontaneous lyomyomas um, uh, forming in the heart, and it's actually been reported in some men as well. It's very, very rare, but because there's smooth muscle cells in the heart, um, there have been case reports where the, the smooth muscle has created uh, this type of tumor um, in boys as well as girls. So there's uh, different ways that the uh, lyomyoma can either occur spontaneously or more commonly through hematogenous spread make its way up. And this woman did have a um, history of uterine fibroids, and she actually had some fibroids removed. Uh, many, many years prior. So perhaps during the removal of her surgery, there was some uh, spread of the, uh, a little piece of tumor that made its way up to the heart during the surgery. Hard, hard to know. Um, and th again, the uh, mass can reach the heart by uh, um, invading the ovarian vein, then making its way up through the inferior vena cava. So that was a kind of a surprise finding that none of us were expecting. Wow. That's great. So I have a second case, but I can let there somebody else go. Let's and rotate and then. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Any questions before we move on? So was she still a donor for her sister? No, unfortunately, oh. because she had to go through we, she had to go through cardiac surgery and then recover through cardiac surgery, um, and the sister couldn't wait that long for the stem cells transplant. So they they found another donor for her though. Thank you very much, Thanks, Daryl. Great. <laughs> there you go. I think we're going to ask Dr. Restrepo to give his cases. While he's getting up there, the, the, the issue I raise is when you see a big mass in, the, in the, any big mass in the heart, you need to look. Is it invading? Is it coming up through a vein? Anything like that. In the left side, I've seen a couple of quotes left atrial myxomas that prolapse through the mitral valve. They're actually. Um, you know, lung tumors coming in through the left upper pulmonary vein, which sits in proximity to the left atrial appendage, if you think about it. So always think about any extension 
of a tumor into the heart, and don't just go for the most obvious. And that, that was it. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, for me, it's a great honor to be here. Thank you, Dr. Sogby and co-chairs of this uh, interesting course. Uh, I have two clinical cases. The first case is a patient, uh, 49 years all female. In 2014, uh, a uh, surgical procedure was performed and uh, an aortic bar replacement in ascending aorta or ventral procedure with a St. Jude uh, mechanical prosthesis number 21 plus coronary replantation, and mitral bar replacement with uh, mechanical prosthesis and yeah, okay. number 29, plus tricuspid valvuloplasty. Uh, three years after, a uh, patient was hospitalized by endocarditis of, of mitral valve prosthesis and tricuspid valve. The surgical team considered that the patient was in a very high risk and decide medical treatment. Uh, uh, one year after, uh, this year in January, uh, she went to the uh, hospital because progressive short of, breath, short of breathness, deterioration of functional clacks to New York Heart Association three, and uh, no uh, history of fever. The physical examination, uh, no relevant findings in clinical examination, cardiac auscultation, uh, normal valvular clicks of the prosthesis, the la laboratory and uh, normal recount of leukocytes, uh, reactive C protein, last two units, and various, uh, various sets of uh, blood cultures were negative. A uh, transthoracic echocardiographic uh, echocardiogram was performed. Uh, we can see here uh, uh, two prothesis, two mechanical prothesis, one in mitral position. We can see a uh, normal prothesis function. In uh, this patient, the gradients were within normal limits in aortic position and mitral position. Uh, this is the view of aortic roof and ascending aorta. We can see the ventral, uh, the homograph in the ascending aorta, proximal ascending aorta. <coughs> no normal findings in, in aorta. This is the color flow Doppler in parasternal nexus. We don't see any abnormal finding. In, uh, in four chambers, uh, there were no abnormalities, and we decide to continue with a transesophageal echocardiogram. A right ventricle is a bit right, depressed. Right too. ventricles, yeah, down a little bit. Gustavo, did you all wonder in the posterior sewing ring, uh, Steve, uh, I don't know if you could see it, and, and Bill, you, you see a little flash of early systolic MR or color back there, so you'd worry about a perivalvular leak there. I'm just yeah. in your differential of thinking, yeah. but you said there was no murmur heard, and she obviously didn't have high retic count or anything like that, so. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of prosthetic material Correct. Uh, in that area, <coughs> so it's, it's very difficult, even from the peristalic long axis to know, but I'm trying to figure out, because she has shortness of breath, no leukocytosis, no recurrent infection, right? Uh, CRP even is normal as to why is she short so of short breath. breath. Well, the RV function looks poor. Uh, don't RV, it? RV function is poor and... Uh, but you'd worry about you know, other things. If there was significant MR, you'd like to see the ventricle being hyperdynamic, right? And it's not. But you uh, also, it looks like the, the root, when you show that uh, other clip there, it looks somewhat smallish and the whole homograph looked a little bit ugly and my triodic curtain is a little bit unclear there. So, you know, she had a lot of surgeries into that territory. So, Lisa T. Where did the homograph come into her? Oh, she had a ventile. Ventile, I'm sorry. Ventile, yeah, that's, I, that's okay. He's, I, a yeah. graft, not a homo. 
Yeah. Not a, not a homograph. Just curious, because I'm thinking backwards. Why did a lady with 40 some odd year old, yeah. at that time she was like 45, Watch has up. a aortic valve replacement yeah. um, with a mentol, you're thinking bypass the valve would be number one, and then Marfan's and some other would be number two, but then why mitral at the same time? Uh, if it's bypass the valve, Schoen syndrome would be a thought, but you don't usually need to replace. If it's Marfan's, they can have prolapse. Um, that's an odd combination without endocarditis to have aortic valve replacement and mitral valve replacement. Your tricuspid repair in the absence of endocarditis. Wait, I mean, you know. You have to have your orthopathy. Right, rheumatic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a rheumatic would be up there and she had something done to the tricuspid. Why don't you show us the next views? We're going to talk you to death, I think. Uh, the, yes. Well, uh, this is the uh, dop uh, color Doppler of the, yeah. the ventricular outflow tract in aorta. The pulmonary arterial systolic pressure was 50 millimeters of mercury, and the right ventricle was a uh, mild dilated with the decrease of uh, with. Uh, global hypocinesia, the right ventricle. This is the tracheosophageal echo. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what do you guys see? What is the diagnosis of? Uh, it's not a lie. It's not a lie of myoma. <laughs> 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 For those of you that are going to vote. <laughs> Anybody from the audience make your diagnosis? Make some, yeah, because there's something pretty obvious. Look at the. It's a, like a LV outflow track view of proximal. It's 106 degrees. So look at that and then think about your anatomy of what you're looking at. Anybody? Don't, so. what's, the mo what's the most striking? A little flat. What's the most striking to your eye? What is the most striking? Huh? Here. Yeah, you got it. Yes, Doc. Basically, you see this pulsating thing, huh? Yes, the, the right diagnosis, diagnosis is. What is that region called yeah. between the mitral and the aortic valve? That's good. You got it. Intervalvular, fib intervalvular fibrosa was one of the names. Yeah. Yes, Very the, good. Aortic mitral curtain. A right diagnosis is pseudonyms of mitroartic intervalvular fibrosa. Fibrosa. Correct. Is the well, is a normal tissue between the aorta and anterior mitral valve leaflet. It's a uh, vascular tissue. And oh. we can see the yeah. normal uh, excursion of the prosthetic uh, valve. The, Emidix is prosthetic bulb, and this is the aortic prosthesis. Uh, we can, uh, what do you think about this structure? Anything there? Could be, be wall, real. Several uh, sets of blood cultures were negative, were completely negative. Maybe so, a suture uh, is a... Yeah. Could be a suture. Could be a, I mean, this is could a be dehiscence. Could be a suture. Huh? It could be a remnant of a vegetation. It could be... Um, watch, watch where the arrow is. Where the arrow is, is actually where the dehiscence right. in this mitral aortic intervalvular fibrosa is, right? So this is like a, almost a dissection in that plane. Yeah. 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 And this is a true pseudoaneurysm, what you see, that little sac. Right. Okay? And that little sac actually can stay blind, and that's why you're seeing this big pulsation, meaning that flow is going from the ventricle into the sac and back, back and yeah. forth, back and forth, and it's not going anywhere. For now. I mean, it could be for now. That's true. Although, although if you look closely, you see the, go, before you get to color, go back. Can okay. you go back, Gustavo? I'm sorry, I'm sounding. So let that play, that one. So look at the tip. I wish I had a pointer. If you look at the tip uh, right there, no, yeah, right, you can see where there's a perforation. See the see how it lifts up. Look to the to the left. So you know there's going to be a perforation there, and you know you're going to have a jet. So that's the 
That's the unblinding of the blind sack. So totally, it's, you could yeah, see that totally right there. there to begin with. Now, it, can, it can dissect into the atrium, then you'll have mitral regurgitation physiologically. Correct. It can dissect into the aorta, and then you'll have aortic regurgitation through this channel, and it will be less pulsatile. Once it, once it, it empties into another chamber, it becomes less pulsatile. So whenever you see this, you're not going to be too impressed with color. See, the color is low velocity, meaning that it's just going in there and swirling. Picture. And that comes out. This, this patient was in, in, he was paced or was he in normal rhythm? It's normal. It's just normal. It's normal rhythm. Uh, this cavity um, full in systole and yeah. collapse in diastole. Yes. With flow, with, with blood from the LB outflow tract. It's a very nice demonstration, Gustavo. Yeah, pretty. This is another view, uh, by plain view, of this abnormality. And this is where the vast majority of complications of the endocarditis, this patient had endocarditis before. I mean, mm -hmm. she may be sterile now, uh, and everything else is negative, but you never know when this happened. Uh, and, and this is the cardiac tomography. We can see this abnormality in, this, in, the, uh, in the area of That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, aortic mitral intervalvular fibrosa. Yeah. We can see a, a big pseudo aneurysm filling systole and collapsing diastole. And it's between the aorta and the mit uh, uh, mitral annulus and aortic annulus, anterior aortic annulus. Uh, this is another plane of the tomography. This is the abnormality. Yeah. And this is the relation with the pulmonary trunk and coronary arteries. One of the compl complication is compression of the pulmonary artery or the, or the coronary yes. <clears throat> patient. This is the relation with coronary arteries. It's and interesting. This is we, the, uh, we, we published a case talking about the coronary arteries. We published a case many years ago. And believe it or not, in the New England Journal of Medicine, of such a case, compressing the arteries and causing hibernation, where the ventricle went down to an EF of 20% and then reversed after you repaired it, mm. it was very unusual. It was pulsating and compressing all the arteries. Wow. Okay. And, and, and this is the relation with the left anterior descending. There is no compression in this case of left anterior descending. In relation to the circumflex artery, uh, uh, this patient uh, uh, doesn't have compression of circumflex artery in this case. But it's one of the complications of this pathology. This is the circumflex artery. And this is the pseudonyremis. Uh, there is no compression. This is, a, this is the second clinical case, a similar clinical case. Is a patient of, I have time, time? Yes? I'm sorry. This is a second, second case, case of the same pathology. To Gustavo, why don't we uh, Very, move. very Yes, let, let's, and. It's, uh, a, it's a patient with a past medical history of severe aortic stenosis uh, by, uh, associated to bicuspid valve. In November of 2012, our valve replacement was performed with a bioprothesis and jute, and widening of the annulus and reconstruction of the aortic root was performed. She was asymptomatic, and two years ago, a routine evaluation, evaluation was performed. Any, any comments? Any comments? See, this is a very eccentric jet, very curious jet from the aorta or so not into the left atrium. Very eccentric jet. It's the only not. thing you can tell is that it is systolic. Right. right. It's like mitral regurgitation, but an eccentric one. But the That's highest right. velocity is up posterior to the right. aortic wall and the aortic mitral exactly. curtain.
Hello. There you go. <laughs> and, and there is another uh, pseudonarium of the mitral artery intervabular fibrosa in this patient. Uh, we can see the color flow Doppler. <clears throat> Pill and systole, collapse in diastole. Mm -hmm. what, what's the first question when you see that? I'll, huh? <laughs> no, I mean, uh, they'll be, uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> they're alive enough to have a TE. <laughs> No, but the, the big question, once you see this, is where is the mitral regurgitation going? Right. You see, and that's your, I mean, because you didn't see it. You saw the sac full of a systolic jet. As you know it's going to be very eccentric going somewhere, most mm -hmm. likely even perpendicular to what you, what you saw already. Oh, and the live case. Live case is ready. Or you could have flow through the... Um, through the per is that what you talk about? Perforation of the yes, pseudo aneurysm. It, it has to be perforated into a right. lower chamber. Right there. It is the perforation. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. So it's, it's common. As opposed to the previous case, and we've written on this before, uh, uh, it was in Jack. If the velocity doesn't alias in that sac, it is blind. That sac is only there, back and forth with the ventricle. If it is aliased like this, you know you have high velocity, it is emptying into a lower chamber lower pressure, so you always look and see where is it going. In this case, uh, there is a perforation of the pseudoneurims. We can see here. Excuse me? No, 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 no. Uh, in this case was a surgical corrected. And this is the trosesophageal three-dimensional. Uh, this is the abnormality. And this is the normal mitroartic intervalvular fibrosa. No? Beautiful. But the more frequent uh, associated causative factors associated with this pathology, endocarditis, and surgery uh, of aortic valve. Aortic regurgitation is a associated causative factor because uh, uh, because the jet of aortic regurgitation is directed to the this area. And by cause the aortic valve is an uh, association with this pathology. Patient operated by, by cuspid aortic valve uh, who suffer endocarditis is uh, aortic roof abscess. And then a pseudonym was. Two, two quick comments. If they're unruptured, um, then you don't necessarily need to operate or do anything other than follow the patient looking for expansion. We've seen a few that have been present and stable over long periods of time without expanding. Usually they will gradually grow and then rupture. But he asked about putting an amplatzer in. This is not amenable to that. The opening to these is from the LV outflow tract. And it, putting a device in the outflow tract is not a good thing. And you're likely to interfere with an aortic leaflet also. It's right underneath the aortic valve. So uh, that's not a very good approach. So surgical is... Uh, if symptomatic ruptured like this, surgery. Thank you, Gustavo. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think they're ready for us for another live case. Uh, Miguel, are you ready? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> are you ready, Mike? Yeah, we're ready. There you go. <laughs> okay, so um, we're going to start in the parasitic abuse. What are you going to And do? this is a gentleman who was just admitted yesterday to our heart failure service um, for uh, consideration for a heart transplant. So he's in a stage four heart failure. Um, he's comfortable uh, at rest, uh, he, and he is in a, in a very low dose of milrinone, 
which we were given permission to stop for a little bit so we could inject the contrast because he's, he's not really that much dependent. It's just for to improve his output a little bit. And uh, he's in the process of, of getting all the stuff for uh, transplant. So can you see the images? Yes, we can. Okay, so you can all appreciate that it's an EV that is enlarged. Um, we actually stopped the image at end diastole and we made a measurement and it was about 6. Point, uh, here we go, 6.7. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a body surface area plus or minus 1.8. So clearly he's in the severely dilated LV uh, category. Um, you all can appreciate the uh, reduction in function. The mitral valve opens, but has a fair distance from the septum. Short axis view very quickly. We can see that there is a fair amount of depression of AEI, but notice that there's some segments that do contract a little bit better than others. Uh, oh. No, I was trying to show the, uh, there's an arrow that we can use for pointing. In the other case, we had it. That's all right. So the septum looks a little better than the post, than the posterolateral wall. So there's some regionality here. Um, we're going to go now to the uh, apical views. And one of the things I like to point out in the apical views, once she gets a decent image. That'd be good. And go ahead and whoop, once you have a good image, freeze it anywhere. Let's go to, ah, that was almost perfect, end diastole. <laughs> and go ahead and make a measurement of the transverse diameter of the LV in this view. Yeah. And we're getting 5.9 versus 6.7 in the parastatal long axis. So already you can see that if we do nothing but take these views and trace them for EF and volumes, we probably are going to get smaller volumes than reality because we already are foreshortening a little bit. Mm -hmm. We had 6.7 in a parastenal long axis and we're getting a 5.8 here. Even though it looks decent, it looks like a nice image, we can assess globally the EF being depressed and we can assess world motion to some degree. Um, I'm sure that if we trace this cavity, the numbers we're going to get are, are going to be less than if we did, for example, an MRI or a CT or something like that. So what we're going to, um, let's go ahead and do a two chamber view. You all can see that there is a, an ICD pacer already there. That's typical of uh, this category of patients. And again, in the two chamber view, we're going to try to get, we, the same thing happens. I don't know if you can all see the scale, but we're going to do the same thing. We're going to stop in a minute here and get a measurement of diameter and end diastole. It's about four, Miguel. It's, it's uh, small. And most we often go. you will foreshorten more often measure. in the two than the four chamber view. I mean, that's from a technical point of view. Yeah. And we're getting 5.9. So again, in both apical views, we're getting about 5.9 versus a 6.7 in a parasitic long axis. So all of this suggests that if we were to just do volumes from the apical views, we probably will underestimate the volumes. So with that background, if it's okay with you, we'll go ahead and set off the contrast. Go ahead. It's definitely regional dysfunction. Uh, why? Why we? So doing right it? now, we're why using do you think we're doing the, the contrast typical here? technique of uh, shaking a little bit and sneaking it. Our esteemed sonographer is a super expert doing this. The contrast was injected, so we are just watching to see if it comes by. The contrast here is not necessarily to evaluate ventricular function. You, you know, you know that you have significant ventricular dysfunction. The settings in the machine the have been changed is, to is a uh, thrombus, right? be for, a, a more optimal for contrast. Or lowering, the and now you see, like like an LV angel there. Beautiful. So let's go ahead and record that. That's uh -oh. great. And then we'll, let's do a two more chamber. Contrast. There you go. I 
uh, once you get the image, you want to make sure that you redo your apical views huh? and many other views that you want, depending what the situation is. You already use contrast. So you want to make sure that you use it to the maximum benefit that you have, including TR jet velocities, right? Depending on the situation. Very the nice. other thing is um, uh, don't forget to, to do off-axis views really of yeah. the apex because sometimes the yeah. thrombus can be okay. um, out of plane. And also, oh, um, sometimes we, we always yes, think uh, of thrombus as like looking like a little ball, but right. a lot of times it's, nice. it's just lining yeah. the wall. It's yeah. layered. So you want to look at for, okay. for an alteration in the shape of the apex. You see how here it looks, um, you know, Kind of We're uh, giving pointy. a tiny bit more contrast now to it. Yeah, aircraft. but sometimes when it's layered, it looks flat. Yeah. So yes. look at the shape, do off-axis images, and and look at every nook and cranny in the in the apex. Especially in a very dilated cavity. Mm -hmm. Is your me mechanical index way low or still? Now we need to acknowledge, right, that even with contrast compared to MRI, this is multimodality imaging. MRI is more sensitive for thrombus formation. So in a, in a clinical situation where you're suspecting an embolic phenomenon, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, the contrast is negative. Either the thrombus went away or you're missing conceivably a layered thrombus that you're not detecting at this time. So you, you have to acknowledge that. And the difference is about 20%, 20 to 30% at yes. times. Smaller ones, not the obvious large ones. Yep, two, two things. Oh, Was, nice uh, focal zone is where, Mike? Where is the focal zone? It's down. It's uh, towards the posterior wall. OK. And the, I thought in your very last view, when you had the LV elongated, I thought there was a little pea-sized defect at the apex. Uh, we will go, we'll have it to go back and recheck it. Um, we're just doing finishing the short axis. Uh, very small. <laughs> It could be. He's the kind of. This is the kind of ventricle that we could be seeing that. Point one four. Point one four. Back to apical. Yeah, Question about an apical uh, T. Yeah, it's just it's low flow. Yeah. So we're going to go ahead and and emphasize the apex. Yeah. No, I may be wrong. Those may be trabeculations. Yes, they are. It looks to me more like a little bit of trabeculation. Yeah, maybe that. trabeculations. But right at the apex, you know, there are from some this position, defects. We, one thing I like to do is a short axis of the apex. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, just that's what Vera tilt, tilt was in that position just to get a short axis of the apex by tilting it down. Yes. That's a nice maneuver that I think very helpful for clots. See, you, we can get down to the apex, and now you can see that it's, it's a nice piece of tendon uh, passing by and, and not a mass. That's a, that's a, a maneuver I think is very helpful oh, any time that you are suspicious of an apical uh, thrombus. Where's your cases here? You want to do it I from here? One. Yes, and then one case. So I don't know if to your eyes, if you, if you agree with me, but to my eye, the EF without contrast looked a little bit better than what I'm getting with contrast. Yes. Now, what we could do if you want, we can trace it. What you guys discuss something, we can trace it and then give you the numbers later. I, th I think partly, Miguel, to me, I agree yeah. with you, is that we were seeing the, good, the better segments and we didn't uh, evaluate, we didn't appreciate the dysfunction the from mid, mid heart all the yep. way to the apex. It was. I, I agree was, with you. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let, let's see. Let, let's see if there are questions anything about contrast like to Miguel, before this, you leave. Uh, in this case, because we have two more cases. Or anything else. Uh, any questions from the audience regarding contrast? We usually dilute, you know, irrespective of what you're using, uh, dilute it in about 10 cc syringe right. and inject slowly so you don't have over attenuation. And as you could see, at times you have you to want, supplement. You uh, want, Bill? I can I can put our esteemed sonographer Kelly to yes. address the audience a little bit of how she did it, the technique she used. Let's do that. Would that be okay? Where uh, Where is Kelly? Yeah. All right. This is Kelly Magrera, our lead sonographer. Hi, Kelly. Hey, Dr. Zagby. All right, you're on. So uh, tell us how do you uh, use contrast? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you at first. Tell, tell us how you use contrast to, uh, dilution wise and how uh, the, the nurses or you are injecting the contrast. 
So the sonographers, as long as we're registered, we can push the contrast ourselves in peripheral IV. Um, we use a 10 mil syringe and um, discard two mils. And so it's eight mils of saline solution to the entire bottle of the Definity. And then we mix it up, uh, attach it to the peripheral IV, and then inject very, very, very slowly. And the you faster you inject, the more attenuation you get. And then you just have to wait a little bit longer to acquire your images. Make sure that MI, the myocardial index, is low. Um, kind of play with your settings. I like to smooth mine out generally. Um, look at the mechanical index of 0.14. On the LV. Yeah. So you don't destroy as much contrast. I think the image is very nice, Kelly. Questions from the audience before... Uh, con regarding contrast use or how, basically, I think I would, you know, dilute even Optison or Lumison, and all of them basically are the same. It's better because otherwise you're gonna have a lot of attenuation. All right. If if not, not Miguel and Kelly, thank you very much, and thank our thank patient for volunteering to uh, to help educate. Uh, our audience here. Thanks very much. Absolutely. Thanks, Miguel. Thanks, Thank Kelly. You. All right, let's give them a round of applause. Okay, we have two interesting cases. Dr. Banks is gonna give uh, his case, and then Dr. Cavalcanti. Yeah, I'd also like to thank the course directors for inviting me, and uh, I'm a neighbor, cardiologist uh, in a cancer center right right uh, across the street, uh, so very, um, a very weird uh, place for a cardiologist to work, I'm full of zebras in our lab every day, but uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll be, I know it's getting to the end of the day, I'll be very quick, uh, just wanted to show this one interesting case, and uh, this is a, a young man, um, military guy who came to our center for treatment of large B-cell lymphoma, which... Um, you know, to, to be 42 and have a diagnosis of large B-cell lymphoma is a pretty bad thing to have to begin with. And I give you the detail on the chemo regimen, but only so you know that he has very limited immunity. But, um, and he'd been through six cycles of, of very heavy duty chemo and then um, another high dose of chemo for um, a stem cell transplant. So he gave himself the transplant. Um, this is an autologous skin, uh, autologous type of transplant, but still you see that he developed low-grade skin grass versus hose disease. So that, that tells you, you know, the kind of immunity we're dealing with. This guy, even though he gave himself, he was still having grass versus hose, which is something I learned that you can still have grass versus hose disease and, and uh, in, in the case of uh, your own transplant. You know, for those of you who are interested in this kind of uh, field, uh, the purpose of you having an autologous transplant is that you do not have rejection, you don't have any of these issues, but then with that comes the fact that you may have a, a little bit higher chance of recurrence of the lymphoma later. If you give uh, a, um, an allo transplant, then you are definitely going to be looking at higher incidence of uh, graft versus hose, but you will not have, um, mo most likely you will not have a recurrence of the problem. But regardless, that, that's what we're dealing with. And with the reason we got involved in this case, actually, he was in the emergency room complaining of uh, pretty severe uh, central chest pressure radiating to the left shoulder. And we were in the EC on the weekend not seeing him, but seeing a tamponade case just two beds over. And uh, the EC attending was, uh, we say emergency center for EC. The emergency center attending was already uh, uh, you know, talking loud that he was transferring a STEMI to St. Luke's. We have this deal that if a patient comes to MD Anderson and uh, the, the, the diagnosis of, a, of a ST evaluation, uh, myocardial infarct, they'll go, without even consulting us, they'll go to St. Luke's. And uh, since we were there and we heard that, we're like, whoa, wait a minute, can we help? You know, and uh, <laughs> we have uh, something called Echo Machines there too. And so uh, <laughs> we, brought, <laughs> we brought it over. Of course, we were dealing with the tamponade, so it was <laughs> easy to just go there. And so we, you know, basically, so this is not a consult. We, we injected ourselves into this one. And uh, this patient was... This is auto-consultation. Yeah, this is auto. 
That's right. I, I'm Doctor gonna... versus cardiology, <laughs> grab versus host rejection. <laughs> I was not rejected this time. <laughs> So he was having positional influence uh, and sitting up and lying back uh, will increase the pain. Um, so he felt better at a 45 degree angle, uh, but confoundingly then nitro also helped with the pain um, in this case. Um, on exam, uh, what you see is what we get. Uh, the blood pressure was a little bit high. This guy was very anxious, uh, diaphoretic and very tense. Uh, the blood pressure was fluctuating, uh, his temperature was changing also. We, we were not sure. We, we had a, a systolic murmur in the left sternal border. The EKG, we had uh, reported that it had shown ST elevations. Uh, they sold it to us, of course, in a STEMI. They had given him Lasix and they were getting ready to transfer him because of the troponin being markedly elevated. So um, that's when we decided to kind of take a look. and. Mm -hmm. Just looking at the EKG, we initially, you know, especially with the PR elevation on AVR, we were not convinced. What was that for me? Um, and then the diffuse ST elevations, we were not convinced that this really was a classic STEMI. So we were more leaning towards this is a pericarditis for for whatever reason, and let's not let's let's dig in a little deeper. So before they got the the case manager and the patient transfer, we were lucky to, you know, wheel in the machine and what we saw was a pretty normal, um, you know, apical views and the ejection fraction measure normal and the, the, obviously the history was kind of atypical. And so we moved forward with obtaining cardiac mechanics and uh, again, he had a pretty normal polar map of his uh, GLS, you know, where the data of that comes from and his normal number was uh, negative 20, which is obviously very normal. Uh, even though there's some data that it, even on the myo and, and, and viral uh, pericarditic uh, syndromes, there are some abnormalities to be expected, especially in the inferior posterior wall from a few short uh, patient uh, publications, but still he was very normal. And uh, so that gave us confidence, you know, this guy needs to stay, cancel this cath. And uh, looking deeper than we saw something very abnormal flickering on the aortic valve. So definitely, you know, let's keep this man and let's plan for certain medical therapy to be started here and we can deal with it uh, later. And so it was the weekend, we, uh, getting late on the day, we, we, we had more history from him and now he remembered that uh, three weeks ago he had some pain, severe pain on his left ear and they gave him a short course of antibiotics at that time. We gave him um, non-steroidals, he had a lot of pain relief from that and the TE was planned for the next day. And so he had what we thought was a large thing flickering off the aortic valve. And, um, and my, our impression was that we had just missed a large vegetation and that he had this now pouch on the um, aortic valve and, and quite a bit of aortic insufficiency also. Which was impressive for us because, uh, you know, uh, remember he had a very normal volume on the uh, 2D and so the very acute kind of uh, condition. We also obtained 3D and just for dimension purposes to, to look out all over around the, the little pouch and know that there was no other destruction of the valve or help us really also assess the area where the um, uh, around, I mean, at the annular area and confirm that there was no suspicion of an abscess there. So, you know, with a with a, a infection, especially an invasive organism, uh, can give you quite a bit of uh, different type of definitions in the anatomy. And so in this case, what we thought we were dealing with was the uh, next to the last one there, a valve aneurysm. And this has been described before. There's been a couple of uh, publications from many places in the world with the, how large they get, and these are associated with very typical infections that destruct the, um, the, the valve. Uh, they, they start very small. You can see in this one a very small little pouch from the original publication. And so um, the, um, the cultures came back with this staff, uh, staff Lugdunensis, who was just creating havoc. Uh, we, 
we have heard now from our pathologists, we've had a few cases now on a, on a series on these patients, particularly patients with uh, immune suppression and they've been, they've been after stem cell transplant. This is a bad staph. This staph is just as bad, if not worse, than staph aureus. And uh, anyway, the patient, uh, after that, he had a military type of uh, insurance, so we didn't see him anymore. But uh, three weeks after that, he was diagnosed with uh, 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 what they thought was acute uh, heart failure, most likely from the AI. They, they thought it was severe AI. They, he went for valve uh, replacement eventually. We, we saw him before that, and now instead of a pouch, he, what we saw that three weeks later was this hole and so, yeah, we just took another look, and now definitely that thing had broken, the bottom had fell off of that uh, pouch. So now, uh, if anything, that, um, that case has made me paranoid. Now, every time I see a perforated valve, I think that three weeks ago I just missed a pouch on him. <laughs> but uh, th just to show you that, that this is a, a bad bug, uh, I, I hear from my colleagues in the county hospital that they've seen a, a queue very... Um, very severe, progressively downhill cases of um, in, in, in IV drug abusers and and so. But anyway, this is a very um, kind of a nice uh, showing of, of of that aneurysm and how it, it evolved and broke away in about three weeks for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, it's interesting, on, on the first image, uh, Jose, that you had, most of the AI was not coming from the pouch. The pouch was still closed. So most like, I mean, uh, I could say that that may have opened again and you had severe, even more severe AI. Okay, so. Because you have cancer. Yeah. And then, right. Let's go for this last case of the day. I appreciate everybody yeah. sticking around. Uh, Start with this case here. There's going to be some interaction, hopefully, to keep you awake. Um, <laughs> this is an otherwise healthy 25-year-old male who presented to the emergency room with a left orbital pain, right mandible pain, right rib pain. What exactly happened is that he was involved to a fight in a parking lot three days prior. <laughs> and <laughs> the pain continued to go on, and then they decided Maybe finally to, to go to the emergency room. <laughs> There was also reproducible chest wall tenderness on palpation on the right hemithorax. Those are his vital signs. This is the x-ray, obviously, of the face there to make sure there was no fracture and there was no rib fractures. There's um, pretty much pretty normal cardiac silhouette, no major findings. So the recommendation was just go home, take some Motrin, and stay away from drinking and get into trouble, right? So he goes home. Seven days after, uh, he presents to the emergency room uh, with new onset, severe chest pain that wakes him up from sleep. He's quite diaphoretic, uncomfortable. Emergency room vitals are shown here. He's tachypnic, and this is his presenting EKG. Any takers? LAD dissection. LAD dissection. Any, uh, anybody else? LAD dissection. That's, uh, wh what do we see? By the way, you said LAD dissection. So what, what do we see here? Can you read the EKG? One and L, okay. Okay. LAD lateral. All right. Troponin now is positive. That would be my first one. Okay. All right, so what would you do now? Hashtag echo first. Hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Reglin. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it did not come from me, okay? <laughs> if you wanted to know, go on the Twitter. There's a big in you know, the political. Coronary angiography? Come on, guys. You know, what, what was the, the hemo? You know, the angiography guy plus or minus PCI, PCI. Coronary CTA, Dr. Berman? Yeah, why not? All right, why not, right? And there is more <laughs> than one correct answer. So who votes for A? Star echo is benign. All right, just go bedside, right? Polkus, point of care, why not, right? Coronary angiography, coronary CTA. So there's more than one, 
All right, so let's go for the sequence. I'm going to show just like the other case. <laughs> what happened was that it was taken to the sequence. cath lab. Okay, there was no time to waste. He was already with the ST elevation. And there was no dissection, actually. No. There is nothing there, actually, <laughs> to the point that <laughs> the, the echo images stopped playing. So, but yeah, there is no dissection. The coronaries is completely normal and not satisfied. Uh, the interventionalist does actually... And LV gram, both in RAO and LAO projection. You can have a dissection of the aorta that involves the coronary when you have a deceleration injury, but a strike to the chest with a fist is not enough of a deceleration no. injury. Right. You get fist. Yeah. <laughs> All right, keeps getting interesting. So we excluded coronary disease, right? So then what happens is that now that troponin was 1.8, if you recall, right? So let's keep looking. Now the bedside echo, so cath lab table to the stretcher, and those are the echo images. We got a lot of motion there, huh? And it does not kind of respect the coronary distribution pattern. I guess it could be some bizarre lateral wall, but there is anterolateral, there is anterior, there is infralateral. All that? right, so six hours after, that's his second troponin, mm -hmm. 200. 200. 200. And actually, it stops there because, <laughs> you know, you cannot track more than that. Our lab, you know, is 200. That's, you know, large enough. So CMR study was obtained now. And those are the images that, you know, kind of reproduce what we had seen on the echocardiogram. There is some wall motion abnormality on the lateral wall. We Anything do happening at the base of the papillary? Or is that normal? I'm not an MRI. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, is there anything at the base of the papillary? There's a lucency down in there. Is no, that just a no? No, okay. no, just right. getting in and out. Yeah. Yep. So anterior wall, maybe a little bit, but mostly that lateral wall that we see. RV looks fine. By the way, this is T2 mapping. This is pre-contrast. This is to look at the inflammation, edema, any myocarditis, any uh, process that would increase water content into the myocardium. As in the normal con cutoff here, around 60. He's around 66, 68. So he is edematous. So there is an acute inflammatory process to mm. explain that. But where actually we become quite like, whoa, what's going on here? Is actually after we give the gadolinium. Normal myocardium should look black, right? As we have shown before. This is way too much. I mean, this is it's like somebody really drill it down a knife into his myocardium. He's you know scarred out all over. And this is after sinus, after gadolinium. You can see there is already that rim, almost like an Oreo cookie. But this it, is his. It, you know, it's interesting that his, uh, you know, the T2 mapping was barely abnormal. Right. Yeah, yeah. And this is an acute event, huh? This is an acute event. Granted that we are kind of more on the short, on the mid level, but still, I mean, I would expect this to be a little bit higher. Now he already has LV dysfunction, as you can see. His ejection fraction is low. His LV is already dilated. Yeah. Right, index volumes. Okay. So now what's going on here? <laughs> A, <laughs> we go for D <laughs> or C? <laughs> no clue. <laughs> this is a no bizarre clue. Takatsubo, an acute flare of cardiac sarcoid. Who goes for A? Nobody. B? Uh, a couple of hands there. C, trade is your answer. You cannot send to Google yet. Yeah, C, I think that would be the best. C word. would be a good one, right? <laughs> Just be aware of not no PHI, right? No personal health information. But how about you, Dr. Zabi? Wait, can we page you? I'll go for C. All right. Go for C. <laughs> he said LAD uh, dissection, but he said it very quietly. <laughs> All right. I mean, could this be a myocarditis that is very unusual in relation to trauma? Uh, to trauma myocarditis. Yeah, I mean that would be a. So let's let's continue here because I that mean, gets interesting. How, how hard did they shake him? <laughs> <laughs> how hard did they punch him? Right. So he was still having chest pain, 24, 48 hours. Episodes now of non-sustained VT, as you could expect, right? I mean that myocardium is such in, in bad jeopardy. Then urine tox positive. Uh. Ah. Now you know why he fights. He Not only. Right. <laughs> <laughs> then he then admitted drinking, right? And using marijuana prior to his symptoms. But, 
But he felt that the marijuana had been laced. And he's talking to me about that. And I said, excuse me, what did you say? <laughs> so a little bit of pop American culture to this Brazilian naive, you know, Brazilian doctor here. What is laced? I had no clue. Did I? Excuse me here. I pull out my phone. So according to Urban Dictionary, laced is a drug is laced into another snack. Because so pretty much you mix in drugs, right? So like, man, that's weed that I smoked last night was laced with cocaine. And that looks like this, you know? So you got, you know, weed with sprinkles of cocaine, which is mm. possibly what he had. <laughs> so multiple consultants got, you know, together and agreed that maybe proceeding with a myocardial biopsy would be unlikely to change his clinical management and not only risky. So he was starting on some heart failure medications and drug rehab and long family meeting was done and a follow-up with cardiology two to four weeks. As you can see here, the therapeutic MRI, right? Because after that, the <laughs> troponin went down, right? It cured him. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, <laughs> nonetheless, this is probably the highest troponin I have seen. I, mean, I guess he could have gone to the thousands, but you know, we stopped there. You can see a flat line. But interestingly, you know, his 30-day follow-up MRI, um, you can see the, you know, it changed from necrosis to fibrosis. I mean, his ejection fraction has improved, but you still see the scar. You still see the lining of that. So a lot of that edema, a lot of that interstitial cell expansion was actually due to a lot of marker. And this is pre, and this is 30-day post. And you can see that pre and post, this was already significant changes into his left ventricular remodeling. And although his EKG had returned to baseline, if you look on the zoomed view there, what am I circling there is what we call QRS fragmentation. It's almost like somebody has a Parkinson's and there's a little bit of some wiggling there. And that is a sign of actually myocardial scarring hmm. that you could see. So that EKG is not hmm. normal. I didn't know that. And when we look at the literature, you know, there have been cases of actually cocaine causing several uh, problems, including myocarditis, as a question mark. And a very bright Dr. Renu Vermani back in 1988 had described actually 40 autopsy cases of cocaine, cardiac death, in which actually acute thrombotic occlusion, think about heart attack or MI, is actually myocarditis when mononuclear infiltrate was actually more commonly hmm. described than that um, in age match controls and in other schemes here leading to chronic cardiomyopathy, which is unfortunately the fate of this gentleman. So um, this is case is a very bizarre to me. I mean, it's still striking that you know an acute cocaine could have caused such a impressive myocarditis necrosis um, that was led to obviously unfortunate uh, LV dysfunction. Everything. So that was fascinating. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Wow.